G'day, welcome. I hope you're having a fantastic day wherever you are in the world. It's been a beautiful day. I'm currently 29th of January 2022, so they say. Okay, oh, I've got something I'm going to share. I saw an article online and I, I just don't know how I come across it, but I, I just got to share it, okay? Stick with me, you're going to like it. All right, if you're interested in Tartaria or just history in the past and what happened in the past and what lies they're, they're trying to hide and stuff, hang around. All right, conspiriology or not. I find this painting curious, and you? Even though nobody knows of its date of creation, the crackleros on the canvas give it away that is more than a hundred years old. If the painter, for the most of his life, lived in the 19th century, we can safely assume that the painting was created in the very same period. Of the subject, plot, of the painting shows us Polish winter, but no matter where it really was, be it Poland or Russia or any other country, the image depicts a common continental climate's winter. Can you spot any unusual details in the painting's subject? Trees, for instance, some people may notice that these trees look trimmed with cotton tr wood trees. In case you don't know, these trees are infamous for spreading fluff everywhere, which becomes a headache for urban utility services to people with allergy and people with allergy. To prevent these problems, utility services usually trim cotton wood trees. The trees from the painting look exactly like those trimmed trees. But where there are similar urban utility services in Poland of the 19th century, or was it something else that trimmed those trees, a force that we're unaware of? Or could it use super powerful weapons, for example? Oh, what am I talking about? Defining the term conspiriology with simpler words, it's a story made up by a person for the purpose of a logical explanation. Usually, conspiracy theories appear when there are a lack of true information about some events or absolutely no information. People tend to make up such, such stories and believe in them. Psychology experts explain that humans subconsciously deny complete lie and can complete truth about anything, but always eagerly believe in something which is half true and half lie. Those who have a talent for presenting information in a half true form use it everywhere, especially historians, not necessarily everyone who tells us the history of the 19th century. A long time ago, when I was about to begin my path in reconstruction of the old technology, I read an article named fantasy or not. Frankly speaking, I wasn't exerting myself when I was writing it, but surprisingly it became extremely popular. Over the next several years I was coming across pictures from it on various websites, particularly English speaking. There were some, even some video adaptations of it on YouTube, made by different authors. What was so special about the article? There were just some photos of unknown technologies that existed almost yesterday from a historical point of view as well as some short notes. The article is going to be similar. Will it find its reader? Only time will tell. If not, I won't be disappointed. Okay, those were just my thoughts aloud. Let's begin. As you never know, smoke never appears without fire. Rumours about some shadow government have existed for a long time, since the 20th century or even earlier. Obviously, nobody has ever confirmed these rumours officially, neither the mass media or exist any existing government. There was one case though, when during Stalin's rule, that there was open discussion in the political sphere about the Freemasonry conspiracy. Look at the statue on the right. Does it remind you of anything by chance? According to the Annonation, this is Brazil, 1860 to 70. What actually was there? A well-known cult attributed to the fam famous nation was decorated with usual Masonic instruments. They are, in fact, the very construction tools of the time. Could it be the thing that caused the very conspiracy? Uh, at the time, apparently, the final image of the object, which should be placed on such a structure, had not yet formed. I hope you understand who I mean. Moreover, there were more interesting buildings in Brazil at the time. I wonder what kind of culture was forced out of there, but Brazil is a different story. At one time, I was generally surprised that a small country like Portugal somehow managed to colonize such a huge territory as Brazil. Moreover, there were Portuguese colonies in Asia and Africa and many more around the world. For comparison, the resettlement of Russian people to Serbia went on for two, at least two centuries. 
with the entire area of the European Russia at the time, including Ukraine and Belarus, and their ratio to the area of Portugal, the population density in Serbia did not even come close to the similar density in Brazil. Probably, here it is exactly the opposite. Brazil could at one time take advantage of the opportunity and seize a small part of the Iberian Peninsula. But historians changed everything upside down. The same goes for Spain. In Spain, by the way, similar mosques, if I may say so, stand almost everywhere even today, except with, with the crosses. But the Spaniards obviously inherited them from the past inhabitants of these lands. The same situation with old temples occurred in North Africa, Russia, and all of Asia, including Japan. So, this is a very interesting theory. A great Russian writer, Leo Tolsky, mentioned in my previous articles on repeated occasions, once participated in the Crimean War, even in the siege of Sevastopol, the one that looked like a slaughterhouse. He wrote several literary works on the topic, but few people now know about an interesting fact from the life of Count Tosky. This is unconfirmed information that at the end of his life he converted to Islam, or even had always been a follower of this faith. Wikipedia doesn't tell anything about it, neither do the history books. For this, Russian Orthodox Christian Church and the Matthews banned him. But why would Tolsky do this? There was another Russian writer, Peter Tchaikovsky, who was also banned from his ideological views that were even more interesting. But there was almost no information about him. Though, those who know will understand. But, for now, let's assume that all these information is just rumours and try to look at it from a different perspective. How could the church of the time track religious beliefs of peoples? Who would care about Tolsky's religion? If he didn't involve himself in politics, nowadays everyone can be tracked, but at those times nobody cared, nobody forced you to accept religion, and if you weren't visiting a church, nobody was considering you as an enemy or as a representative of any other religion. So, what's the deal with Tolsky's religion? Another courteous detail, as it was said earlier, Count Tolsky participated in the Siege of Sevastopol. At first glance, everything is clear. Though they fought against invading British forces, Tolsky was there until the very end and managed to survive. The further history of Sevastopol and the whole empire is well known to us, allegedly. But, as usual, digital archives provided us with some interesting documents. There was one curious historical person, Grand Duke Nicholas Nikolaevich Senior, one of the sons of Russian Empire, Emperor Nicholas I. His biography is quite eventful. Crimean War, Russian-Turkish War, rank of the Field Marshal General, Inspector General of the Cavalry, and Inspector General of the Russian Engineering Forces, a Grand Duke. But here comes something controversial and game-changing. Pay attention to the flag of the Grand Duke's camp. I guess comments are needless. Who did Count Tolsky fight against in Crimea? As Wayne Famous Rose said, everything mixed up. People, horses. Oddly enough, the press of the 19th century didn't hesitate to print such images. It's not that in nowadays, even nowadays, now it becomes much clearer. What kind of ideologically ideology could Tolsky have and even why? Who really fought against the British in the Crimean War? What religion ideology did they have? Who fought them for the British side? It seems that our Count Tolsky's desperate and deceitful, praiseful literary works about the winners of the war, let us call them by their real names, remain true to his original beliefs deep inside. Let's get clearer that the shadow government indeed exists and that it's not some kind of conspiracy. For the last 200 years, they have been completely rewriting and rebanding history and society. I'm not discovering America by saying this, but unfortunately, over the last 200 years, society has become so depressed that the few people that care about the truth, neither about the modern times nor about the past. Some time ago, when D. Trump was elected among the president of the U.S., there was a real hype about it in Russian mass media even among the ordinary people who were eagerly rooting for rump. Why was it so? Probably because of the Russian propaganda. Whatever is the true reason, Russia will never admit that it waged an information war on a Facebook in support of rump. Originally, Rump promoted himself as an enemy of the globalists, or even that the very shadow government. For some unknown reason, the Russian politics liked it 
in for that way. For people who know the real political setup, it seemed very odd. It looked as if the bees were against the honey, and for Rump, it's not clear whether he was indeed against the globalists or was just playing a staged role. I'll go with the latter. But he would have certainly be surprised to see America the way it looked in the 19th century when the globalists received it for the first time. That's been scrubbed. What was there? Something was there. Was it an airship? Look at the back here. Was there an airship there? Something's been scrubbed here. That's all been scratched out. Why? Why did they scratch that out? This is how Broadway Street in New York looked in the late 19th century. This building is probably still there, but I don't think it still glows that bright. The New York skyscrapers are discussed in many researches nowadays, but few people have seen them working during the night time. The Helios, located at the top, didn't glow on its own. There was a complicated engineering technology that current is currently destroyed, thanks to the very globalists. By the way, the famous Moscow skyscrapers, also known as the Seven Sisters, were built by Stalin in the image of American skyscrapers, which is an odd fact. Another curious fact is that on one side of the ocean, such buildings were being actively destroyed, while on the other, they were actively erected. And not just usual skyscrapers, but skyscrapers with a very unique old technology. According to some people, the project was overseen by Brina personally. When Kushkarov and his team come to power, the project was cancelled. Though I did not, didn't, don't think that Kushkarov understood anything in this technology, and he was just a metal worker. Bria, on the other, Bria, on the contrary, was an architect and received his education during imperial times. Why did Stalin try to build constructions that were against the mainstream agenda? Could it be an act in, of insubordination towards shadow government? No matter what the truth is, he perished. So did his political plans. But at least some of his plans were realised. There are talks currently about the state of these buildings with some people asserting that they were old and dangerous condition and thus should be damaged. So I won't be surprised if they decide to do it. Nobody will question it. Why did the globalists decide to execute this vandalism around the world by demolishing various old world constructions on the 18th to 20th century? And why are we getting the glimpses of our true history? Could it be that they just can't control the leaks any longer, or could it be another tricky move? You may believe what you consider to be true, but today we are just dealing with conspiracy. So we've come up with any date. So we can come up with any idea. Have you ever seen an artificial sun? In 1903, it was common. There was absolutely no need to hang a helios on the roof of skyscrapers. They could be. They could be stuck on a post in front of the entrance, as for example in the restaurant in 1903 in Europe. The trail of light from the photo suggests that it was not that simple in its nature. It is not caused by incandescent lamp or mercury discharge lamp, which were used for most of the t entire 20th century. There was completely different kind of fixtures described here. By the way, over the years, I have collected a lot of evidence to this conclusion. Maybe someday I'll publish it, but it's probably time to show the world such a sun alive. <laughs> joke with a grain of joke. Why did the globalists destroy these those technologies? A rhetorical question. Let's approach it a little bit later. But now, try to understand how they destroyed it. We'll use a one-sixth of the planet as an example, though I believe at the beginning of the 19th century, it was a much larger territory, probably half of the entire world's surface, no less. This is the very same South America of the late 19th century. There, as you can see, everything is according to canons. The official image of the ideology apparently has already taken shape. It even resembles modern times, except that the background is different. By the way, concerning the half of the world's surface, there is a conspiracy theory that the country of Peru is nothing more than a former island of Peru and a Slavic god, and Persia is also the land. But of the sons of Peru, the so-called person, 
the author of this version, if I'm not mistaken, was an academic from Menko. If it's really so, then how, then where did the slabs go from this land? They could not disappear without a trace, and it's true, how could it be understood? Let's Google the translation of the English word slave, and probably everything will become clear. Everything is in full accordance with the principle of divide and rule. They divide one ethnic group into many, and many, some of them, slaves who disappeared in the course of natural selection, and then the name of those slaves have already become a household name. Well. Nevertheless, the old technologies were destroyed. There are many conspiracy theories out there. The nuclear wars of the 19th century on the internet, even involving aliens, convincing theories with serious proofs. But wait! What strategic goals could aliens have if they were involved? To destroy the old technology and replace it with rent from oil market? Are you serious? To collect paper money and send them to another planet? If aliens had been involved, they would have turned this planet into the second fatum. If the 19th century there was indeed a nuclear war, the belligerents would have certainly been the terrestrial origin and made it of some biological matter, material. They would ha also have interests related to this planet, but was that war nuclear? If so, the aftermath would affect both sides, given that they use weapons similar to what we currently consider as nuclear, and what if they use the, some other type of weapons, which is called nuclear, now due to lack of knowledge. If the winners of that war were made of some other biological material or extraterrestrial origin, they would not have any correlating interest with us humans. So I think that all those wars were waged by humans, except that the weapons were different. Everything was artificially forgotten, and we were given fake history with bows and arrows and stone axe, but what type of weapons did they really have? I find this 19th century photo of four foundry workers amusing. Could they be casting the very weapon there? A foundry is a very interesting place on its own, a person that has overgone through such a production. It is no longer afraid of any technical qualifications, which are not known to any other category of workers. One could argue here, but I do not impose my opinion here. They can extract alcohol from literally anything that it may contain it, get a copper scrap from seemingly impossible places, and do a bunch of other tricks. After the shift of the stove, they can single-handedly drink a 1.5 litre bottle of dubious quality vodka without a snack and then come home still almost sober. In other words, these people are tough. The look of the 19th century found it did not differ much to the modern ones, at least in Russia, if not for some strange items. I don't know why the photo wouldn't load a minute ago, I just uh, refreshed it and it's loaded, so... Probably such plasmoroids were used to make the very weapon that destroyed the whole world. Is it a burning hydrocarbon under pressure or a beam of light or maybe the Garion's hyperboiled? What kind of weapons were made with such units? I'll leave these links in the description for you. This hyperboiled was known as a death ray. Um, it's not a geometrical surface, so it's utilized in the device's design, but the death ray laser light device, thought up by an author many decades before lasers were invented, that the protagonist, engineer, Giron, used to fight his enemies and try to become a dictator of the world. The idea of the death ray, popularized in at the War of the Worlds, H.G. Wells, among others, was a commonplace in science fiction of the time. By Tolstoy's vision, is unique for the level of technological detail. The hyperworlds, a different power capability, capability differ in their effect. The device uses two hyperbolic mirrors in contrast to Wells' heat ray, which uses a parabolic mirror to concentrate light rays in a parallel beam. The larger hyperworlds can destroy military ships on the horizon, and those of less power can only injure people and cut electric cables on walls of rooms. So I'll leave these links in the description. I think I might have to read that book. You see where I'm getting at? Maybe the cannons had um, lenses in them. Like we've seen um, videos where they were shooting air and they knock stuff over. The product corresponds with to the production. I wonder how they adjusted the cannons without lifting equipment, with lef levitation probably. Because yeah, look how heavy they are. Like, what technology apart from rails? Like, how did they move it? There is a conspiracy theory that the Battle of Moscow was won thanks to the new 
pan full of Division 28 guardsmen, but rather due to the very weapons shown above, that they were somehow urgently resurrected by Soviet authorities. I am not trying to undermine the heroic acts of the Moscow defenders in any way. I'm just saying there was a little bit more to it. Application of an old weapon was contrary to some secret treaty, but the influence of the outcome of the war. Stalin was persuaded to stop using the resurrected technology and got something in return. Did these cannons really need a real recall cable? The gun with such a mass and caliber as in the photo would not move a millimeter if shot using powder charge and it looks like it extends telescopically which in general makes it impossible to shoot with a powder charge. Experts correct me if I'm wrong. What does it mean and why is the chain attached to the cable? We will consider the, the cable not a rope. To prevent the gun from rolling away? Of course not. This weapon was deadly. They carried the, this weapon with special locomotives, locomobiles, which have sunk into the oblivion along with this weapon. Could they have been grounding? Like if it was electric, could they have been grounding it? So there's the old steam tractors towing it. What a good and environmentally friendly transport there was at the time. But we talk about locomobiles some other time. It's a topic worth looking into. The locomobiles seem to be capable of transporting these massive weapons. Perhaps it was very the very technology that destroyed the past civilizations, but how did everything work? There are already a lot of conspiracy theories on the subject, but let's add one more. For this, let's return to the title photo with horses and riders. According to some reports, winters in Central Europe appeared to only in the central uh, 19th century. Before that, there was a favourable climate, destroyed by some currently unknown telegenic event. Whether this event was technogenic or not does not really matter. Perhaps the powerful weapon inadvertently caused an ecological disaster is not important. If this really happened, why are the soldiers in the 19th century painting equipment with antediluvian armour and weapons of not some advanced ones? Oddly enough, the warriors are armed with some kind of axes and primitive firearms. What kind of weapon is it and how was it used? Making up a non-existent weapon wouldn't do any good for a 19th century pa painter. Firstly, at the time, he would have been immediately brought to light by art critics, and they already existed in the 19th century. Secondly, this artist is far from alone in depicting such artifacts in his works. If all artists portrayed such weapons in this way, there is every reason to believe that their appearance is quite realistic. Another curious detail is that these so-called rifles don't have st stocks and could easily be gripped over its middle part with its hands. They look more like pipes used by the Indians. They shoot poison cactus needles, as shown in some movies. Perhaps this is all nothing more than an artist's grotesque, or even worse, a state order for the re reconstruction of history according to the new rules. Leo Tolsky, after all, in his War and Peace, wrote about anything except the weapons that used to turn Sylvester into dust. Let's delve into it. Let's start with the axe. Battle axes, according to history, were used in the armies of all nations. Of course, as those nations developed, the axes were replaced with more advanced weapons. I wonder how many battles were won with battle axes. I doubt many. Chopping wood is a necessity thing in necessity thing in military campaigns or using axe to cook a porridge <laughs> like a fairy tale but here let's give a word to military historians while looking at the axes from a slightly different angle we will again address our old friend a famous antique auction where forbidden items flicker sus suspiciously often I question you know, is it an axe as well as like an electronic weapon This one is some Indian painting with a warrior holding the battle axe. Do you really think this glamour whip could really fight with such an axe? It reminds me of the antidote of about a gay man in the army, but I guess there's enough jokes for today. The axe in the painting resembles more of a certain phallic object, which in general and in spirit of the work is more logical. Maybe the painter was carried away by the unknown direction by a muse, and we need to look at something else. Let's look further.
The auction's website assures us that the battle axe comes from the 17th century. However, its origin is unknown. We, of course, willing to believe and begin to think, well, let's assume that it is an axe like this can pierce an enemy's head. But why is it designed in such an odd shape? Perhaps this is just an artistic idea of a gunsmith. Let's look at something else. Looks like an energy weapon. You know, like on Star Trek where they have the phases and the energy comes out. One of the more, one of the even more interesting officially referred to as a Vajra axe, one could safely regard it as a modern, re modern replica. There are a lot of science, but there is one small detail which haunts me. A stylized head. As in the previous case, the presence of such a detail brings to mind the idea that it's just not for decorative purposes. The same applies to the blade of the exam previous example. What if it was used to fix the axe in an upright position, in a tree trunk for example? Perhaps there was some tactical need for this in some old movie, I don't know, remember which exactly, during the storming of the gates of the fortress, the soldiers threw the axe at them. Then one of the most dexterous climbed up the upper niche using the protruding axes, like an adder ladder and open the gate everything is more simple maybe here we have something similar actually many old weapons are mistakenly considered primitive but let's look at it with a different and fresh look but not burdened by the myths of the ancient Greeks there's a lot going on in this photo look at this fragment of some antique painting I give you only a fragment because I don't want you to be distracted by many other elements of the painting according to the plot of the picture there's some kind of mythical battle going on you can see flying darts swords and even maces but spears in the background stand as if nothing is happening it is a reserved regiment waiting for an ambush of course not by the way given the length of such spear about four meters do you think an able you'll be able to hit anyone swinging it in the crowd and as for special skeptics take a closer look at the tips of these spears could they really pierce someone in a crowd the most astute readers may have already guessed what connects such axes and spears if not don't worry then we'll come to an explanation very soon another type of the axes may be completely different weapon where maces clubs and there's no English word, there's a Russian word, but you can find many definitions and photos of these weapons on the internet as well as historical and other data, but let's not focus on this and rather go down, get down to business. More precisely, let's look at the similar items sold at auctions. I suppose everyone is familiar with this weapon, or well, at least from the illustrations of various kinds of fairy tales. I wonder why the lower item was grinded this way. Well, let's see the others. It down here it's all changed the handle's got a lot of wear in it these look like some hybrids between an axe and a sword I wonder if the muskets really beat each other with such weapons a musket by the way seems to be a firearm but for some reason all the musketeers and all the movies fight exclusively with swords why it would be probably be boring if an anti Artigen just shot and left. No romance. The storyline should be embellished somehow. Indeed, how can one fight with a sword like that? Use it as an axe, but it doesn't look like it. And an axe? If anyone has seen the tool used to chop cabbage before being salt down, he will immediately understand that this is it. Only the ribs are not sharpened for this reason. And the right tool from the image has some sticking some spikes sticking out what was that purpose what was its purpose could it be used for fixing this tool in its vertical plane ceiling for instance like with the before mentioned example there are more questions than such items themselves this one seems to be another example of a military weapon I wonder how much did its head weigh when it full metal. Swinging with such heavy weapon in the crowd is actually harder than it seems. If previous items could still somehow be used for fighting, this one looks more like a symbol of power with such a mace. One could only pose on the throne probably that they successfully did it. We should look at it sometime, something easier. 
According to the description, there are detachable parts of these maces, but why do they have holes? Was something inserted in them? And why? <sighs> According to the description, these are detachable parts of those maces, but why do they have holes? Was something inserted there? Why? These objects are made in such a way that they can't be attached to the shaft. How so? Unknown, we seem to be entering a logical dead end again, but let's dig deeper into the auction archive. It isn't the very weapon that we saw in the first picture, in the hands of the warriors. Yes it is, but without the cabbage chopping attachment. It is obviously a detachable part which is attached during battles. But wait, did it shoot with darts? Of course not. It was shooting something more serious. The dart was put into it so that no one would ever guess its true purpose. Instead of those darts, it used complementary unknown type of ammunition. And apparently, this weapon worked no worse than a modern assault rifle. Although it did shoot bullets, it didn't, although it didn't shoot bullets, the nature of the projectiles can be guessed from the type of armor that the warriors of that time wore, metallic knight armor. To conceal the truth, these weapons were turned by historians into melee weapons. Quite convenient for them, isn't it? So, what binds the axes and spears together? These would, could they be an uh, electronic weapon? Such spears can often be seen in different old pictures. As a rule, they are of giant length and simply struck into the ground with no intention of throwing them anywhere. During the Olympics, game spears are usually thrown for some reason. But what are the reason? In the USSR times, students were forced to take notes on Lenin's works, and after they were checked, the notes were not used any not used to anyone, even though the most ardent communist the point of it, this was the process itself. When writing phrases, the human brain subconsciously fixed their meanings to a certain degree, stupidly and primitively. They forced people to learn unnecessary information. Here, forcing to throw spears, they stupidly and primitively programmed the audience and the thrower himself that the spears must be thrown, and there is nothing else behind it. For some reason, no one thinks that could have Otherwise, nobody cares about this at all. It's an interesting point, isn't it? Look what we got here. It's so beautiful. Wow. What's going on in here? It turns out that the spears could be used for a completely different purpose. There was no need to throw them. Using the right cap, duck-shaped, in the latest example, spears could be turned into useful technical devices. That's why they had to wear the chain mail. This is some kind of city holiday in Dresden at the end of the 19th century. We observe that spears with special discs constitute almost the main part of the pavilion structure. There are actually many more examples of the spears in old photos. Dresden got smashed. It was a beautiful looking city. Hey, there they are in Venice, apparently serving as piers for boats. They were even labelled with stripes. Now, by the way, they are nowhere to be found in here. Here in Brazil again, you can see the very modern, very same spears and the wireless cableless train. Spears were fixed at the building and nobody wanted to throw them anywhere. Nighttime photos of these spears are super rare. Ah, beautiful. Hanging lanterns on those spears made them glow in a strange way. Or, if the spears were grouped, accumulated in a certain way in a metal framework, they were electrified the entire metal structure, accumulating a certain number of spe such spears. An army platoon, for instance, would make the huge, those huge cannons shown before shoot. 
There is a reason why. Some engravings depict marching formations with spears and cannons pulled behind them. If you attach an axe blade to a spear, you get a halberd, which functions identically. If you bind these axes together with an elgert, you will increase the power of the weapon by the number of axes or soldiers carrying them. The thick rope wire you saw near the huge cannon was the very same elgert. I can't say it right, sorry. But of the appropriate size. I hope you will get it now. Well, let's get back to the conspiracy. Yeah, interesting. So. Now, we know what the substance was. You can find many videos on the internet that show the very substance which powdered all the antique tweet devices. This is information that this substance was produced from gold. There is a reason why gold coins were replaced with paper money and coins made of other metals. But let's digress for a moment and talk about the smallest rubble money monetary unit. The Copia Run Ruby. The official story behind this name is that it is related to the famous ancient image of the warrior that kills the dragon because of the word allegedly comes from the word which is spear in English. But there is another view which states that the ruble was actually a unit of weight for weighing gold, the same as Zoltec, which is, was also a unit of weight and a coin. In old times, spears, oh sorry, in old times rubles were also used to be made of gold too. Applying the above mentioned facts to what we know about the spears, we may assume that one gold ruble equaled the amount of gold needed to power up one spear. There used to be a practical side to this standard. The reason why gold coins were withdrawn from the usage by common place people is to avoid any possibility that someone will find out that the gold can be used for a component for a production of the special substance we talked about earlier. At first they at least wrote on a paper money that they are backed up by gold to encourage people to use it and then they st even stopped doing this. Now you know the reason why many old coins were made of gold. So where the coins used to charge up the device, conduct it. Gold coins could be exchanged for goods, or they could be used to obtain light, heat, or weapons. This could not depreciate in any way as long as the human race is alive. Consistently needs to consume material and non-material benefits to heal and defend itself. The price of gold has always been solid. Even when the shadow government destroyed the technologies of the past, gold did not a drop in price at all. It never will. A narrow circle of people knows that all of these candy wrappers, petrol rollers, can collapse at any moment, making history repeat what happened 200 years ago. Whoever has gold will survive. Those who don't possess it will die. By the same way, I wonder if the great, giant, great Tartary with its vast territory existed 200 years ago and earlier. How did its government function? I think the answer is obvious. There was no government. There was a single guarded federal center for the emission of the gold money. The rest was independently supported locally. There were no parasites over the society. Unfortunately, this is just a superficial image of the empire. I don't think they'll ever find out what really happened it was. The shadow government pulls us all into oblivion and there is nobody to stop them. Those who try to do something were destroyed. By the way, the 1990s there were numerous reports in mass media about the loss of gold of the party. I think it was something bigger than the membership fees of the CPSU. Can you guess what it was all about? Currently Russia is said to have its own gold reserve, but does anybody know where it is located geographically? If at some point the price of gold will suddenly change, be sure that some of the big players decide to break the rules and convert back to the traditional gold. Then you can expect the snowball to keep rolling around the whole planet. Followed by the corresponding attributes like wars, epidemics, uncontrolled waves of immigrations and other, the global propaganda 
will surely explain everything according to their agents as they usually do. It could be lack of fresh water or anything new. My intuition suggests that the end of the oil economy is not far off. Yeah, I agree with that. It's not far off at all. So if you're still with me now at the end of this, I want to say a huge thank you to all of you. Uh, if you could do me a favour and hit that like button and, and share and perhaps subscribe if you're not subscribed. And if you're subscribed, please check, see if the bell's on. You might miss some videos I've got coming up. Anyway, thanks for watching. Raise your vibrations. Much love. Bye now.